Rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rains fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. In his book, Hearing God's Voice, Henry Blackaby, who is a pastor and also the author of the famous study, Experiencing God, tells the story of the first funeral he ever conducted. It was for a beautiful three-year-old girl. She was the first child born to a couple in our church, he says and the first grandchild to their extended family. Unfortunately, she was spoiled. While visiting the little girl's home one day, I observed that she loved to ignore her parents' instructions. When they told her to come, she went. When they said, sit down, she stood up. Ever been there? Her parents, though, laughed, finding her behavior cute. One day, their front gate was inadvertently left open, and the parents saw their child escaping out of the yard and heading toward the road. To their horror, a car was racing down the street. As she ran out between two parked cars, they both screamed at her to stop and turn back. She paused for a second, looked back at her parents, and then gleefully laughed as she turned and ran directly into the path of the oncoming car. The parents rushed their little girl to the hospital, but she died from her injuries. As a young pastor, this was a profound lesson for me, says Blackaby. I realized I must teach God's people not only to recognize his voice, but also immediately to obey his voice when they hear it, for it is life. In this final passage in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus leaves us with a striking image. It's an image that serves as the third and final of three warnings that conclude this section of Scripture. Jesus has been warning us about danger. He's been warning us about the possibility of destruction if we don't heed his words. And this third warning takes the shape of an image of two people building houses that in all respects look alike. But one is built on a solid foundation and withstands the storm and the test of time, while the other house, just as beautiful, but built on a weak foundation, crumbles and ultimately collapses in a heap when the storm comes. It is a house that does not withstand the test of time. The difference between the houses is not in the beauty of the facade. It's not in the ornate carpentry that adorns the interior. In fact, no description of made differentiating one house from the other other than the foundation upon which they are built. The difference is found in this twice-repeated refrain. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does or does not do them. That's the difference. I realized says Henry Blackaby, I must teach God's people not only to recognize his voice, but also immediately to obey his voice when they hear it. It is life. And the question Jesus puts before us as we come to the conclusion of this passage of portion of Scripture is, will your life withstand the storm? The Old Testament book of Proverbs actually serves as the backdrop for the image Jesus is drawing upon here. Proverbs 10.25 says, When the tempest passes, the wicked is no more, but the righteous is established forever. And Proverbs 12.7 says, The wicked are overthrown and are no more, but the house of the righteous will stand. And again in 14.11, The house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. This is the backdrop Jesus is drawing on. Now, we don't have to to work very hard to realize that in these verses, the house is not a literal house, although some people take it that way. God is not promising that those who live in authentic relationship with him, that those who heed his voice and, and respond to his voice will have nice physical homes that won't decay. That's not the point. 
But some take it that way. See, God wants us to have nice places. God's going to protect our house. That's not the promise here. Come on. The house here is a representation of your life and mine. And it's, the imagery that Je- it's in this imagery that Jesus draws upon in these closing verses of the Sermon on the Mount. Back in 1999, I led the first of four mission trips I would lead to Belize to work with George Farrar on, among the residents of the Belizean Caribbean island of Key Calker. On that first trip, we stayed in a motel called the Motel 1788. Don't really remember what the numbers stand for. They did have a significance, but I don't know what it was. And because it was only one of the only places on the island that featured air conditioning which was really important for our non-heat-resistant Northern Michigan mission team. And it also had rooms that were big enough to hold an entire mission team where we could meet. We stayed in the same place again in 2003, 2005, and 2009. Now, in 1999, just north of the Motel 1788, right on the very northernmost tip of the inhabited part of the island, an enormous and very beautiful new resort was being built. Its massive white walls gleamed in the sunlight. It was clear that this was going to be one of the most fantastic hotels, not just on Key Calker, but in the entire nation of Belize. It was massive. It was clear it was going to be beautiful. But when we returned in 2003, little progress had been made. And by our return two summers later in 2005, it was made clear why. Massive cracks running from the ground to the roof and sagging and crumbling walls. When I asked George what had happened, his reply was, poor foundation. The builders didn't lay the right foundation. They didn't take the time to build the right foundation. And the one they did lay cannot support the building. It was falling down before it even made it up. And today it's a ruin. Throughout the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has made it clear that life in the kingdom of God is focused on something more and something deeper than that which most of us focus on, which is our external behavior. He's called us to a righteousness, he has said, that surpasses that of of the strictest, most stringent religious people of his day. He said, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, to the people who were his first hearers, that was like saying, if, if your righteousness does not, does not surpass that of Billy Graham and Rick Warren and Bill Hybels, and, and, then you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Because we look at the Pharisees, and we, 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 see, we get this external look at things. And so we know what Jesus was thinking, and, 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 and we know about the conflict between him and the Pharisees, but in the eyes of the people, they were well-respected. They were looked up to. They were the ones who could do it. They were the ones who got it. They were the ones who knew how to live in a relationship with God. They were the ones who were doing everything right. And Jesus looks at the people and says, unless your righteousness exceeds theirs, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You see, he's called us to a righteousness born of his spirit at work in us and not our ability to follow the letter of the law. And the oft-repeated refrain in chapter 6, and your father who sees what is in, done in secret will reward you. Points us beyond that exterior facade to that place deep within us that serves as the foundation and the fountain of life of all that we do and all that we are. You see, he seems to be focusing on the exteriors in chapter 5, and he makes it clear that his people will live differently. But then in chapter 6, he says, okay, so let's not take this and turn it into a new form of legalism. Let's not take my life and turn it into a new list of do's and don'ts that you have to follow because it's not about a list of laws. It's about a relationship with me, Jesus says. And if our lives are to withstand the storm, the storm that Jesus talks about here, which could be any storm, ultimately it's the final judgment. That moment when we all stand before God and give account for what we've done and give account for how we've lived our lives, that's ultimately what's in picture here, but but it doesn't exclude any storm that we might go through in life. 
And the truth is that every single one of us, every single one of our lives are going to be battered by wind and rain at some point in our lives. Some more so than others. But for each and every one of us, there will be a moment when a storm comes out of left field that we were not anticipating and not expecting. And Jesus asks us the question, is your life going to stand or fall? then it's not about the externals. It's not about just your behavior. It's about your foundation. What are you building your life on? And if our lives are to withstand that storm, the foundation they must be built on is none other than Christ himself. And calling us to a righteousness that's higher than that of the Pharisees, the people everyone in Jesus' time thought were, were getting life right, in emphasizing a life of rich, godly, Jesus-honoring fruitfulness based on a rich interconnection to God, Jesus is not calling us to a new redefined legalism. He's calling us to himself. He's calling us to allow him to live for us, die for us, and then live in us through his Holy Spirit. Look at verse 24. Everyone then who hears these words of mine. In Jesus' day, teaching the way Jesus taught, teaching without referencing the spiritual authority of someone else or of several someone else's was completely unheard of. You didn't do it. All of the great teachers of his day taught in the name of someone else, based their, their teachings on that of, of other great teacher, teachers. And so they would say, the rabbi so-and-so says, or as the rabbi so-and-so has said, and they would, they would couch their teachings in what someone else said, just like pastors today do, couch their teaching in the name of Jesus. See, they did it that way too, right? So we say just as Jesus said. They did the same thing, only they were talking about other rabbis. All of the great teachers of Jesus' day taught that way, but not Jesus. He didn't teach that way. Everyone who hears these words of mine. That's why the response of the people recorded in verses 28 and 29 was, and when Jesus finished these things, the crowds were astonished at his teachings. Why? For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. He was teaching someone as someone who had authority based in who he was. His authority was not based on what somebody else said about the law of God. His authority was not based on anything other than who he was. He was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. The scribes were the ones charged with teaching the law of God to the people of God. And they never taught based on their own authority. They always taught based on the tradition that had been passed down to them. Great teacher to great teacher to great teacher. That was the corrective for heresy in their day. And Jesus didn't teach that way. They taught not on their own authority, but on authority derived from others. Jesus didn't do that. He didn't say, look back at or consider what so-and-so said, or consider what so-and-so did. He said, look at me. He was saying things people had never heard before, and he was giving uh, the words that he was saying an authority that no teacher of the law of God had ever dared to give his own words before. His emphasis is not on the words of others, but on his own words, not on the life of others, but on his own life. Jesus takes the spotlight and shines it directly on himself and says, look at me. Follow me. Come to me. And then he dared to say, because when you do that, you're coming to God. What kind of a person is it who could or would say such things. In his highly influential book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis puts it this way. I am trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher. We hear that all the time today, don't we? What a wonderful teacher Jesus is. 
but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell, you must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, which is what happened. That's why they crucified him, because he claimed to be God. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. The crowds were astonished. Why? Because he taught as one who had authority and not as their scribe. And truthfully, the scribes were teaching the way they'd been taught to teach. The only firm foundation, the only solid foundation upon which we, we may build our lives is Jesus Christ, the narrow gate, Lord of the narrow way. There is no other way. And the process Jesus gives us for building our lives on him involves two steps. The first step is to hear. Everyone who hears these words of mine. The first thing we have to do is listen to what Jesus is saying. We have to hear him. Now, the challenge today isn't so much that people don't know what Jesus said or what his church teaches. It's what they think they know but don't. The word for hear here is a word that also means to heed, to listen to, to understand. The call here is to pay attention to the words of Jesus, to seek to understand them, not to run them through our pre-existent filters in such a way that we hear them, but they do nothing to transform the way we live and the way we think. People hear lots of things these days, but no one listens anymore. In the counseling master's program I just finished, professors spent most of their time teaching me how to do one thing, how to listen. And you know, a lot of times, that's all it takes to help people get unstuck. They don't need all the techniques. They don't need psychotherapy. Some do. But a lot of people just need to be heard. I was taught to seek to really understand the experience, the thoughts, the feelings, the words of someone else, not to assume anything, but to really hear people. And let me tell you something, that takes work. It isn't a passive process. When I'm sitting with someone in that kind of a relationship, I can't tune out every once in a while. I can't let my mind wander, and I can't assume that I know what they're going to say next. Spend a day actively listening to others and you'll be exhausted, I promise you. And I'm not by nature a good listener. I'm the kind of person who jumps to conclusions. I'm the kind of person who interrupts and finishes the sentence of others. I, I'm the kind of person who I think I know where they're going and so I jump ahead to... How many of you are married to someone like that? Or know someone like that? How many of you are someone like that? Oh, I know where you're going, honey. No, you don't. No, I don't. You know, so, so you know what Becky started doing? She started going, okay, where am I going? You know what I'm going to say next, so what am I going to say? Okay, I don't know. <laughs> but we do that, don't we? Nobody listens anymore. We all think we know, and so we jump to conclusions, and we do the same thing with Jesus. And so for many of us, we have a Jesus who looks an awful lot like a conservative Republican or a liberal Democrat or whatever else we are because those are our filters. And we have a Jesus who makes sense to us. 
And let me tell you something. Jesus blew away whoever he met. He didn't fit anyone's stereotype. He didn't fit the stereotype of the conservative Pharisees. He didn't fit the stereotype of the liberal Sadducees. He didn't fit the stereotype of the political leaders. He didn't fit the stereotype of a Messiah of the down and outs and the outcast either. Because he accepted them and he went to them and he touched them and he wasn't supposed to do those things. He blew everybody away. When was the last time Jesus challenged you? When was the last time you came to the word of God and went, huh, I got to live different today. When was the last time we stopped thinking we knew where Jesus was going and just listened to him? How frustrating for the one who's trying to communicate with us to say everything but not really be heard. And that's a lot of people today. But it's not just people. Jesus has said everything. In the way he lived, in the way he taught, and in what he did. For you and for me, he said it all. But how many of us really listen? Listening has become waiting for others to stop talking so that we can insert our ideas, our thoughts, our words without ever really hearing them. And we do the same thing with Jesus. We do the same thing when we read the words of Jesus in Scripture. We do the same thing when we study his life. In fact, earlier this century, there was a big movement to try to discover the historical Jesus. See, everybody, all these, especially it was uh, particularly French and German theologians who figured that, that we were reading everything with, with filters so strong that we, we needed to get back to the historical Jesus. And so there were these the move after move after move to get back to the historical Jesus, to strike from Scripture everything that the real Jesus probably never said or taught or did. And one scholar a man named Albert Schweitzer was finally willing to be honest enough to say, this has been a failure. Because in every attempt, all any of us have done is create a Jesus in our own image. So for the liberal, Jesus is a liberal, and we get rid of everything else. For the conservative, Jesus is a conservative. And that's what they said, and we get rid of everything else. So if you don't believe that miracles can happen, you strike all the miracles. And they did. If you don't believe that Jesus really rose again, you strike all that. And they did. And what every one of these scholars wound up doing was recreating Jesus in their own image. And that's what we do. We do the same thing. But these crowds, when he taught, they were astonished because he taught as one who had authority and not like their scribes. If we're going to build our lives on a solid foundation, if we're going to leave a lasting legacy in life, if our lives are going to withstand the storm, we have to really listen to the life-giving words of Jesus, but we can't stop there. Look at verses 26 and 27. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And when the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house, it fell and great was the fall of it. It did not just sort of fall apart. I saw a picture from my hometown this last week. They had straight line winds, not tornadoes, but straight line winds, but they were so strong. Somebody's, one, one person, the whole end of their house got blown off. You could actually, it was like someone took a saw and went right down the end of the house and you could see the rooms. It was like a dollhouse. The whole, just the, the edge facade was completely gone. Complete destruction. The fool here and the fool is the Greek word mora 
from which we get our word, moron. <laughs> Jesus calls people morons. Don't you love that? You all think I have an edge to me sometimes? <laughs> Read Jesus. It's like, you moron. The fool has heard the words of Jesus. Both of our builders, wise and foolish alike, have heard the words of Jesus, really heard them, really hearing, really listening, leads to doing or the hearing is useless. What good is it if I hear Becky ask me to do something and then I don't act on her words and do it? It's no good. At least not to her. Do you hear me? Yeah. Honey, can you take the trash out? Okay. Two hours later, trash is still sitting there. Did you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> you going to do anything? Uh, eventually. That doesn't do any good. The difference between the wise and foolish builder here is in the doing of the words of Jesus. That's the key to the life of discipleship in Jesus that we've completely missed today. There's something for us to do. Jesus says that the wise person is the one who hears these words of mine and does them. Well, the moron, the foolish person is the one who hears these words of mine and does not do them. Jesus requires an active response. He challenges us not just to accept him or believe in him. That is the beginning of the journey for sure, but it's not the sum total. Rational acceptance of him was not his fundamental mission. His goal for us is that we do what he says. The great reformer Martin Luther said it this way, doctrine is a good and precious thing. See, some people want to throw that out. We can't throw that out. It is a good and precious thing, but it is not preached for the sake of being heard, but for the sake of action and its application to life. So what is there for us to do? It's the doing of following Jesus. St. John said it this way in his first epistle, whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Those are hard words. I love the way the NIV translation team renders this verse. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Ouch. If you claim to follow Jesus, follow Jesus. Live as Jesus did. St. James takes the argument a step further. You believe that God is one? Okay, that's a, that's a difficult, you know, three in one. That's high theology. Trinitarian theology. You believe that God is one? You do well. Even the demons believe. And unlike us, they shudder. Even they believe. But they don't do. They don't respond. And that's the difference. The wise builder responds to the words of Jesus. For the first century Jew, belief and action were completely inseparable. Today it's possible to ace an exam in Christian theology, to ace an exam in Christian ethics, and not be following Jesus. I had a seminary professor, an Old Testament professor, great Bible scholar. He's on the translation team for the New Living Translation, been, been on several translation teams. His aunt was Elizabeth Elliot. I mean, this dude was connected. All right? He was having lunch with some of us one day, and someone asked him where he studied. He said, University of Michigan. We're like, no, you know, like your theology, where'd you study Bible? He said, the University of Michigan. We're like, what? I mean, me coming from Ohio, there's nobody at Michigan who does anything good. That's like the pit of hell. I said, really? Yeah. From one of the greatest Bible scholars of the day. I said, who'd have thunk it? He said, well, I said, why isn't he teaching at a seminary or something? He said, because he's an atheist. He knows the Bible better than any pastor alive. 
He just doesn't believe any of it. But he knows it. And that's who I studied under. We can ace and examine Christian theology. We can ace and examine Christian ethics and not be following Jesus. What good is knowledge if it doesn't lead to action? What good is theory if it's not put into practice? What good is theology if it doesn't transform our lives? So Jesus says, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. So commit to lighting up your world with the light of Christ. Commit to penetrating this world with the preserving effects of Christ as the salt of the world, bringing out the flavor of Christ and preserving, acting as a preservative in our culture. Share the good news that Jesus, far from avoiding unclean things, came not to avoid them, but to make the unclean holy. Value relationships. Love people, not stuff. Refuse to respond in anger. Live empowered by the rich source of life found in the Holy Spirit at work, transforming us from the inside out. Your Father who sees what is in secret, Jesus said, over and over and over again. Love your enemies, including those who seek to do you harm. Don't draw attention to yourself. Draw attention to Christ. Pray simply but powerfully. Live simply. Engage in spiritual disciplines as a way of soul training and walking more deeply with Jesus. Have the courage to enter life through the narrow gate, which is the cross of Christ, and walk the narrow way with Christ. That's what it means to follow Jesus. That's the picture he's just spent the last three chapters painting for us. The section of scripture that we've been walking through since January. And Jesus doesn't shy away from warning. He warns of destruction for those who take the wide, easy path away from him. He warns of branches who don't bear fruit being pruned and burned. He warns even warns of his public rejection of those who call him Lord but don't do the will of his Father in heaven. There's that annoying word again, do. Which he equates with the words he speaks. The will of his Father in heaven are the words he speaks. And now he warns of a beautiful house, a beautiful life, that falls in a great heap because it was not built on a solid foundation. He is that foundation. And we build on it by listening to his life-giving words and then leaping into life with Jesus. In this world of social media, of Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, action has been reduced to likes and shares and follows. But less and less actually acting is being done. A 2014 study led, it, led by Dr. Kurt Gray from uh, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill analyzed the, um, a Facebook page called Save Darfur. It had more than 1.17 million members indicating that they were concerned and wanting to offer support in some way to the horrific events in Darfur. Now, the team only had the resources to examine the first 100,000 members but to their surprise, they discovered that 99.8% of those who liked this page had never donated to the cause. And 72% had not recruited anyone in their social media circles to help. And then he commented on the research. They raised almost nothing compared with what a similar campaign would have raised offline. The reason is you got to look great without having to pay. He compares this to eating junk food. It's the equivalent of refined foods. It's engineered to make us like it, but it is ultimately empty. And then he concluded, despite the chorus of voices touting the transformative potential of social media, when it came to recruiting for and donating to the Save Darfur cause... 
the most popular social networking site in the world appears to have hardly mattered. 1.17 people said we need to do something about what's going on in that country. Almost none of them did anything. It enabled more than 1 million individuals to register their discontent with the situation in that country but it largely failed to transform these initial acts into a deep and sustained commitment to the work. May we not become Christians who like Jesus' Facebook page, who like his comments, who retweet his tweets, but don't actually do anything. Folks, many people call themselves Christian, but few follow Jesus. But Jesus makes it clear. Those who are his are marked by belief and trust in him that is made visible in action. Those who hear these words of mine and do them are the ones building their house on a solid foundation. Hear and do. May your life and mine be marked by a willingness to build on the solid foundation of Jesus himself to enter life by the narrow gate of his cross and to walk the narrow, winding, difficult way with him. The words again of Henry Blackaby, I realized I must teach God's people not only to recognize his voice, but also immediately to obey his voice when they hear it. It is life. These are the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we have come to the conclusion of a beautiful section of scripture. We've dug deeply over the past six months into your words in the Sermon on the Mount. May we not just be hearers of the word, but doers. May we be committed not just to saying we follow Jesus, but to actually following you. Take our lives and transform them by your Holy Spirit at work in us. May we have the courage to follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.